Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're glad you're, you're here today on a Saturday morning here in Indianapolis. It's raining. Uh, Brad says it's 80 degrees down there, and he's in his shorts. Uh, but welcome. We have a very exciting show today. We have Scott Hogue, who's uh, a guest expert talking about his exhaust systems that he's developed. And they're, they're high quality. You'll really enjoy listening to him. And if you have any exhaust questions, make sure you put them in the comments. Uh, Brad, what is Kenny talking about today? Uh, Kenny is going to be talking about um, using uh, street brake pads on the racetrack versus using race brake pads. That, that should be really interesting. There's a lot of fallacies about uh, uh, race to street pads, so it will be very interesting. And then we will have guest expert Scott Hope from MRT on. But before that, I want to announce something that uh, Scott has graciously uh, offered a book that we can give away during the show. So if you're live today on the show, a little bit later, we'll announce how you can uh, participate in the giveaway. And the book is called, let's see, it's Engineer Plus Enthusiast Equals Excitement. And Scott used to work for Ford, um, and he was a program manager on the 01 Bullet and the 0304 Mach 1, and it's the inside scoop on how that was developed, and it's just a really interesting story. So he'll be giving away that book. It's a $79 value, and it's a beautiful, beautiful book. So anyway, Brad, let's get on. I'm I sure want to remind everyone. Yeah, I want to remind everyone, if you're viewing on Facebook, uh, please be sure to give us a like or better off a uh, heart-shaped wrench. Um, and, of course, follow our Speed Therapy uh, Society group page. That's where all the inside scoop information and fun stuff goes up. Um, also, if you're following on YouTube, be sure to like the video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. And if you click the little bell next to the subscribe button, once you are subscribed, then you can get all notifications. So every time we load a video or we go live with Cars and Coffee, you can be sure to tune in. And, and so um, we got... Tons of videos on the YouTube channel. So, and there's also a lot of resources on the Facebook, our Facebook Speed Therapy Society Facebook group. So make sure you join that to, to get even more information, more tech stuff. Okay, Brad. Okay. So um, we've got the uh, the video, one of Ken's uh, tech videos. So this is going to be uh, street pads uh, versus race pads. It's just a, a quick overview uh, Q and A that he did. Uh, previously, so let me see if I can get this set up correctly. Bear with me a second, sorry. Okay, can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, and it's not working. Well, does that surprise anybody? No, nope, but we have a, we have something else we can try. Hang on just a second here. <laughs> okay. So I always I have a backup plan, Carrie. I'm going to show a peek of Scott Holmes' book while you're getting that ready, Brad. So look at okay. here, guys. Here we go. The brake pads are ultra super important if you're going to the track. I sell people street pads for the street, track pads for the track, and never the twain shall meet because your operating temperature on the street is way less than operating temperature on the track. And brake pads, brake pad compounds, there's three elements to it. It's heat, friction, and wear. And you take a, like a street pad that's designed to run under 500 degrees and you go on track and you have eight, 900 degrees, all of a sudden the, the friction will go down and your wear will go up. And I've seen too many times I've seen people show up for the first track day with stock brakes and some of them don't even make it through the morning before they burn their brakes up or you go going that straight away, they can't stop and they run off the track. So I mean, brake pads are super important. And like the, I know there's a lot of people who try to get away with uh, like the like high performance street brake pads. Uh, well, it's, if it's your first time, maybe. You might get by with it if you're not really using the brakes. If you start using the brakes, it's not going to work because they only go up, the compounds only go up to about 800 degrees. And like I say, my cars, I'm running 1,200 degrees rotor temperature. And I need a brake pad that's going to be the, the medium uh, operating range has got to be somewhere in the middle. And the pads, I, I you that use a, a, a 
400 to 1600 like in a hop or the, the newer pads that we're using we're really really happy with the g -Locks. i'll get something that's like 1800 degrees that starts at 200 degrees so it's a really broad range and we can actually get those brake pads pre-bedded so you don't have to wait okay so that was short and sweet so that was um, short and sweet yep but it so was we very have informative. A lot of people, people are here excited to listen to Scott on exhaust. We have fishing JTS, and he says he actually has a 22 Mach, Mach 1. So that's really cool. You'll enjoy listening about the history of the, the Mach, Mach 1 that uh, MRT developed, or not MRT, but Scott Ho developed. Fred Francher, good to see you from Louisville. We have Dylan here. Good morning. Uh, we have Lance from Fox Body FX here. He's jealous. Uh, so of uh, Brad's weather, I'm sure. And then we also have Calvin Goring. Good to see you. And I know Joe Johnson's in there someplace and Eric Leahy, it's great to see everybody. Uh, make sure you comment and think of questions you wanna ask Scott Hogue. And I'm gonna start with uh, introducing him right now. So Scott Hogue is our uh, expert on uh, exhaust systems and he uh, is the founder and president of MRT Performance and he's with us today. Uh, he's also, um, what's interesting about it, he, there's a couple interesting facts before, I'm gonna let Scott talk about himself a little bit, but I wanna mention a couple of things. MRT, uh, does anybody know what that stands for? It's, yes. It, you, yeah, Scott, you know. <laughs> it uh, stands for Mustang Racing Technology. So that tells you what a Mustang enthusiast he is. And we, he's been in business. 19 years at uh, 23 is going to be his 20th anniversary and we're really excited that's wonderful to go on that way uh, lots of people know mrt from the industry but uh, and he's expanding into other product lines but his heart and soul i believe is with mustangs uh also the other thing i think is interesting uh, is that kenny and scott have the same philosophy and passion for performance in the aftermarket uh, they align by offering the highest quality engineer products for the performance enthusiast. I mean, his quality of products, Scott's are, is really good. Um, but anyway, without further ado, Scott, I'm gonna introduce you and we're excited for you to be here this morning. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you got started in the industry? Um, sure, that's kind of a, a, a fun story to me because uh, uh, my wife and I kind of see it at different angles. But, uh, but bottom line is I've been in the tuning and performance side of the automotive industry since before I could drive. Uh, that includes uh, doing some unwanted modifications to my dad's car while he was at work not watching me. So uh, truly grassroots. Uh, fast forward that several years of uh, going through college and, and then working, working for Ford. Um, that tinkering, individualizing, uh, performance driving side of the of the industry has always been uh, of interest to me. So truly, I was a car guy found in the automotive industry um, at Ford, and people kind of would take that comment and say, "Well, of course." Well, if you're in in the industry, uh, you'll know that that's not a common formula. In fact, sometimes uh, you're a little ostracized being a car guy working in the auto industry. Um, being a fringe kook guy, that kind of stuff. I can wear all those badges proudly. Um, but while at Ford, uh, the, uh, I, was, I was doing track day performance driving, um, off-road stuff in my version. That means kind of missing a corner. Um, the opportunity came up at Ford. Uh, I had manufacturing, uh, chassis, and overall program product development experience. And the opportunity came up at Ford to uh, take a very unique position, actually it was a brand new position at Ford, that was developed after the 2005 Mustang was introduced at the, uh, the Detroit International Auto Show uh, in 2000. So five years before the car was gonna be produced, they, produced, they showed this all new, exciting, retro styled, um, cool Mustang. The first time in Mustang's history that it was a ground up from scratch vehicle designed to be a Mustang. Um, all of that's cool and exciting. The industry the, of customers got excited about it. And, uh, and then the reality set home of, we still have five years we need to 
build and sell Mustangs, or Mustang will die and we won't have a chance to build this car. So uh, the Mustang customization um, attribute department, whatever was developed uh, under the, the leadership of uh, Art Hyde, and I got selected, fortunately, to take that role. And my job description was very simple. It was keep Mustang interesting, exciting for the enthusiast, the people who live, love, and like to celebrate Mustang. This has to be cars for them. And from that process came uh, the 01 Bullet. Uh, then we followed on with the 2003 Mustang. Uh, and then the car that, was, that made it to the drawing board but never happened was going to be actually a 2004 uh, Boss 302, but uh, wow. maybe, maybe we can talk about that one someday. But uh, uh, the reason that didn't happen isn't because Ford forgot the enthusiast, but it was simply too close to the 05 launch. Uh, we needed all hands on deck for the 05 to make sure that it really was a spectacular car. So I can't criticize that decision. I can't believe you had that much leverage within Ford to, to develop these enthusiast cars. I mean, that must have been really exciting for you, especially since you're such a car enthusiast. Absolutely. It was, it was a dream job. Uh, clearly, right time, right place. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm blessed to have, have had that opportunity. So Scott, I know that you started MRT, and I think you started MRT not in the exhaust business, but in uh, how did you start MRT? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so back in, in 2002, um, we started the, the concept of, of MRT, and it was basically uh, built on uh, conversations that I had with my wife, Lisa, on, you know, we need to do this, it would be cool if we could do that, right, all these kind of things, and uh, I think she got tired of my whining and said, well, if you want to do these things, uh, put together a business case, let's review it, and if, if we think it works, uh, do it. Stop whining about it. Um, so I did that, uh, much to her chagrin, uh, on one of our holiday trips to Minnesota, which is 11 hours of car time. Um, I had her captive, and I, I pitched my business case. So uh, that, was, that was basically the, uh, the beginning. Um, and... The idea was to take the systems engineering concept that, uh, that we were doing at, at Ford and at the OEM level and, and take it to the aftermarket. And the intent was to rise the quality and execution of the aftermarket experience to enthusiast customers so that the car that they already loved and bought for the OEM, they could individualize it and love it even more and celebrate that car uh, more fully. So I know that sounds, you know, very romantic and car guy kooky stuff, but that literally was, was the goal. And uh, how we bring parts to the aftermarket in the last 20 years has changed dramatically. I'm not saying that I caused all of that change, but I certainly have been a part of uh, that change. And the end result is, um, you know, look, look at the SEMA organization and how popular uh, aftermarket performance and upgrades are and what size business that represents in the industry. Um, it is, it's no joke and it's not a fad. It's here to stay. It's part of Americana. Well, I, I find it interesting that, I mean, you have like the trifecta. You have the engineering experience, experience from Ford, and then your passion for Mustangs. I mean, those three combined. Yep. That's a great combination for a, a, a good business model. So yep. totally agree Thank with you. that. And, and I know Lisa, so I'm sure she quizzed you in and put you through your polls <laughs> in, in, before you started this. Great gal. Absolutely. But she also works for, <clears throat> worked for Ford as well. And I think she was more in the um, bean counter area analysis of yep. businesses or something. Yep. Strategy. Right? Yep. yep. Business strategy mm -hmm. and, and engineering. She started as an engineer. So, you know, I couldn't. I couldn't just fluff things and get a buyer. She's, she's sharp. Yeah, she is very sharp. So the um, exhaust, well, one thing I wanted to mention is that you talked about SEMA. Now, how many cars have you brought to SEMA? Uh, uh, tell me about that. 
We've, uh, we've displayed cars at SEMA for 19 years. We built 21 cars. Um, we have 19 design awards and one best of show. So uh, it's been a phenomenal trip. Uh, SEMA happened this year, uh, this week. Uh, I was not there this year. Uh, the, the rationale behind that is very simple. Uh, we are, we're busy at MRT and we don't have enough resources to do things with uh, excess comfort, so we're here making parts so that uh, we don't give our customers the excuse of, well, we're all at SEMA, so I couldn't make the stuff for you. So mm -hmm. that's yeah, why no, we're here. I totally understand that. We didn't go to SEMA this year, and I think uh, talking to a lot of our uh, suppliers and vendors and partners, uh, they didn't go to SEMA either. So I don't, I think yeah. since uh, COVID, um, yep. they don't probably don't have the participation. We're going to be at the PRI show here in Indianapolis, which is really easy, and we can sleep in our beds yep. at night, which I love. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely. I so, might see you there. <laughs> good. Definitely do that and stop by our facility, too. Um, what else was I going to ask you? I want to ask you one more question. I'm taking up too much time, and I'm going to go to Brad shortly. I want to talk about your book just a little bit because we are going to be giving away one of Scott's books, Engineer Plus Enthusiast Equals Excitement. Why don't you tell me a little bit about how you started that and, and what it's about? Okay, sure. Yeah, and, and Dave's taking a quick picture of the of the book so you can see what the the cover looks like. Um, this book is is different than a lot of the the traditional um, car publications. Um, the book started based off of the the pushing and prodding of Tony Alonso, who is a a car enthusiast and owner. He owns a Bullet and Mach 1, actually he owns several Bullets and Mach 1s. And every time we go to events and to club uh, meetings, we would kind of have a, a mixer get together afterward. And it was kind of a, a fireside chat, just low key, casual conversation. And we would always talk about uh, the process of how these cars get built and some of the insider stories, uh, things that we did, challenges that we were faced with, that sort of thing. And he said, we got to write these down, got to write these down. So um, I finally uh, conceded and we, <laughs> yeah, he came up to Detroit and we sat and I believe it's like 20 hours worth of interview. He just rattled off question after question, and it's, it's more of a uh, interview fireside chat type format book. And it's all about the insider story. You know, what were, what were the, the challenges? What were the issues? What's the, what was the political climate internally? Um, the things that a normal uh, qualified book writer, author, and, and editor um, wouldn't necessarily have access to. So it's, uh, it's a different twist. Uh, we've actually had some people, you know, car Mustang enthusiasts that have gotten the book and they said they just found it just a, a, a fun, interesting read. Uh, I've had a couple people comment on the book that uh, really aren't necessarily Mustang enthusiasts, but they're automotive industry enthusiasts. And they picked up the book to try to get that inside glimpse, glimpse and uh, they found it very very entertaining and, uh, and educational. So um, it's just a different twist. So in the book, you're gonna see a lot of pictures and content and data that you haven't seen already out in the, in the media and the traditional channels. So it is really something different. Is this the one I, I saw uh, on, on your store shop, MRT online, that it was open, it was a certified, I can't remember what you call it, the authenticated yep. book. Is that in that, this book too? So we can open it up and see it, or is that a special um, book? Yeah, yes. Yep. Dave's showing you a kind of a, a glimpse of, of that right now. Um, so in the publication, so this is a single run publication. So when they're gone, they're gone. Uh, but of the publication, there were 300 uh, collector's editions. And what makes it a collector's edition is that it's a numbered book uh, in sequence of, of 1 to 300. and has a certificate of authenticity, has a couple little Easter eggs in it, which you can see on that certificate. So that sticker right in the middle of the certificate is 
actually a bullet sticker. So for those of you who know the 01 bullet, they are all serial numbered and uniquely numbered. Not all of the stickers went on cars. So I was um, held as the, uh, the keeper of the, they didn't find themselves in the marketplace and counterfeit bullets were being built in uh, underground shops. So um, I uh, got permission from Ford before the publication of the book uh, to use up the remaining stickers uh, in this way and make it in this book. Can you talk, Scott? I think we lost your volume. There we go. There. Okay, perfect. So, so what we're going to do before we get to the uh, ask the expert questions, uh, Scott, we you graciously offered to give this away in our giveaway today. Yes. And yep. So we are going to give it away to you're going to at the end of the show you're going to pick a number for me and I'll tell you between like one and ten or one and twenty or one and a hundred and the person that that, that uh, answers this question or does this task will be uh, um, I'm really losing my words here. <laughs> it's going to be able to win the book. So if you want to win this book, either put down that you uh, sign up for a newsletter and Brad will be putting the newsletter uh, link in the comments and then comment that you sign up for the newsletter. Many of you are probably already receiving that newsletter. So uh, just put that you've already signed up, but you need to comment that you either signed up or you have it and you'll have a chance to win this book. Uh, it's very interesting, especially for those ones that people that own the bullet and the mock one. I mean, that's just a phenomenal book. And so we'll be doing that at the end of the show. You'll be picking that winner for us, Scott. And the reason I'm saying the newsletter today is because we are over the holiday weekend and through the holiday, we're going to be offering a lot of really cool new Kenny Brown stuff, mainly on the apparel line. And I want to make sure that everybody sees that if they're interested in that. We've had such demand for us to come out with a line, especially since Kenny's passed. So uh, look, make sure you look for that, and everything will be in that newsletter. Okay, enough about that. Brad, are you ready to come online? I am. Here I am. Um, I was frantically searching for the link to the newsletter, and I cannot find it. Okay, well, I'll get it up there. And How we'll great is that? <laughs> okay, I will look for it. Thanks. Okay, so um, anyway, uh, where were we? <laughs> um, Scott, so um, I've known you for a, a long time, um, but I wanted to kind of get into the meat and potatoes of uh, MRT. And, and so um, my question is, what sets MRT engineered performance apart from your competition? Um, I, I know, you know, premium quality and production and manufacturing, but can you kind of just run through the, the bullet list of, of really what makes you so special? Because you are, you know, pretty special uh, company in, in person. Good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and we, we think that we are uh, in unique space as well. And, and there's a reason for that. So it's just not us, us thinking it. Uh, MRT was designed from day one to be um, a, a low volume niche manufacturing company um, that can put specific attention to detail and specific controls in place that become very difficult to do in a high volume mass production world. Um, not that high volume and mass production is not good, it's just different. Uh, some of the benefits of, of the process that we have at MRT is an uncanny attention to detail that just physically cannot be done at high volume. Um, so while at Ford, my whole world in manufacturing was about high volume manufacturing. How do you design quality in? How do you monitor the process to uh, predict uh, tool wear process change that could trend towards uh, a quality issue and if you can predict that you can nip it in the bud and you can prevent it from happening before it occurs and that's how you keep quality up in a high volume manufacturing world um, i was blessed to work directly with dr deming uh, while at ford which was one of my highlights of my career uh, for those of you who don't know who dr deming is um, 
he was the uh, expert in manufacturing that the United States sent to Japan after we blew them up. And he was instrumental in getting Japan back online commercially and how to do so designing in quality into the process. Uh, Ford Motor Company had been using Dr. Deming since day one continuously uh, to employ those kind of uh, philosophies in the manufacturing process as well. And while I was at Ford, uh, I was a production supervisor at uh, an engine plant and we were designing ways to do computer integrated manufacturing and therefore got to work with, with Dr. Deming. Um, so one of the fun side note sparring exercises that uh, I was able to have with him is how volume of production affects the methods that you can use to control quality. And uh, as volume goes down, your sample rate opportunities go up in incredibly. Uh, so in the OEM world, um, what we would strive to do is to sample and inspect a couple parts per thousand produced, right? So if you're inspecting two parts per thousand, that means that 998 of them didn't get inspected at all. Um, you could be producing a, a good amount of parts incorrectly or not quite to the, the fullest uh, specified criteria. Uh, as the volume goes down, we can inspect things more frequently, but if you design in your manufacturing process those checkpoints, um, you can have 100% inspection. In fact, as MRT employs, we have four-time inspection for every product that we ship. So instead of inspecting two per thousand, I inspect every part four times. Uh, in doing that, it's not saying that we slow our manufacturing process down to a crawl and we just don't make things very fast. Uh, we actually have very good throughput. In fact, uh, compared to other exhaust manufacturing companies, I will take on the challenge that we have the best performance historically over the last 20 years of order to delivery. We, we fulfill our orders and we deliver our products in a extremely quick turnaround without holding millions of dollars of inventory, which if you can't do that math, um, if you have uh, thousands of exhaust systems sitting on the shelf with the average cost of $700, that's a paycheck for somebody. Not me, but for somebody. Uh, so uh, how you take the approach to manufacturing the product is one of our key differences. The second is how we design the system. So we design the systems on vehicles. Um, in the engineering world, you kind of have two masters and there's always an arm wrestling debate over which is the preferred best way of doing engineering products. One is to have CAD being the master, meaning that you design everything on a computer and you say, build it. Uh, the second is you have the part being the master, which in our case is we design the part to the car. So we literally have a car in the shop that we design the system to. That's not only for optimizing the fit and flow or the, the, the fluid dynamics of, of how the exhaust is routed, uh, but it's also giving us an opportunity to do empirical testing, which is driving the car and we get to see how the sound is outside of the car, inside of the car, at idle, um, at highway, at performance speeds. So what we get is then a real picture of what the customer is going to experience when they buy the system. Um, you bundle those attributes together and that puts us in a space that isn't like any other manufacturer out there. Okay, Scott, th um, thanks a lot. And, and while you were talking, I was kind of giving a little uh, tour of some exhaust tubing and some other stuff from the from your shop camera. And so um, it, it looks like, I mean, materials are pretty, pretty important to you. So a T304 is, is pretty much all you use in terms of stainless for your exhaust systems. Um, yep, that's you know, right. Explain a little bit about materials. Yeah, so 
there are there are basically four materials period that that people would recognize in exhaust systems. One is mild steel, which is what used to be used on exhaust systems. It's it's just mild steel, and sometimes it's got a, a luminized coating on it to make it last a winter, but it will rust out. And the you know the exhaust systems that fall off cars usually are the mild steel uh, produced uh, products. Um, and then the second grade of, of steel, which is definitely noticeably better, is 409 stainless. 409 is the lowest grade stainless that can be called stainless, um, meaning that it's, it's more affordable. It will rust, and in time it will rust out, uh, but it will take much longer time than mild steel to, to rust out. Um, the OEMs these days pretty much use uh, 409 stainless as their primary tube construction. Um, the tips almost exclusively now are 304 stainless steel. That's the part that you see. Um, so if you see red rust on a tip, that's not particularly handsome. And uh, they try to, to minimize you having that experience by using 304 stainless, which is the third grade uh, material that, that is used in in exhaust construction. 304 is the highest grade uh, stainless uh, used for exhaust systems. Um, there are higher grades of stainless available. They're usually saved for things like uh, surgical stainless steel and that sort of thing. Um, as you increase the grade of stainless steel, the product itself becomes um, a much harder, uh, tough, material. It's harder to machine, it's harder to work, um, it's harder on the equipment to do those types of things. Um, the elasticity, flexibility of the material changes. So the very, very high grade stainless steels can become very, very brittle when they're exposed to things like uh, thermal shocking, heating and cooling, heating and cooling, that sort of thing. So 304 is really the sweet spot of the best grade of corrosion resistance and, and material stability, longest lasting material uh, for the, the performance industry. The last product would be titanium. I think most of us have heard of titanium. Um, it's extremely light and it's a terrible product for an exhaust system to be put on the street. Um, it will fail. It, it, it really will succumb to the, the vibrations, the thermal shocking, uh, it'll crack, it'll fail. Um, some people listening will probably say, well, then why in the heck does the race industry use titanium? Um, like I said, it's a very light, very strong material. Um, it's not tough, uh, and tough equals longevity. Um, if designed appropriately for a 24-hour race, it's a great product to get an advantage from, from a weight standpoint in that application. Um, our products need to last quite a bit longer than 24 hours, so uh, we do not reach for titanium uh, in any of our applications. Okay, so um, Scott, um, what are your your top selling in, ter in terms of Mustang um, exhaust systems? What, what what are your top sellers? Um, well, in the Mustang uh, arena, the it really depends on the generation of Mustang. We make uh, an exhaust system uh, for, our, for our 1964 Mustang all the way to current date. And uh, it, it really depends on the era. So on the vintage Mus Mustangs, a complete exhaust system is normally what people are looking for because uh, either you need an exhaust or not, right? So it's usually together as, as one kit. Uh, as you get into the more uh, current and modern uh, vehicles, we tend to do portions of the exhaust, like an axle back or a cat back versus a, a complete manifold back system. And that's predominantly because the factory is using 409 stainless steel. So in many cases, uh, the factory parts that don't need to be changed, don't need to be changed, right? Why, why take the money and throw it after something that you don't need to change? Um, if you're looking for sound, go after changing the axle back on a, on a 2022 Mustang. Um, in the new Mustangs, like the 2022, uh, there are other sound mitigating things in the factory exhaust system. There's a mid resonator, which um, 
actually in the 2022, uh, that is probably one of the more common things to change is take the resonator, um, factory resonator out of the midsection and put in an H pipe. And we're showing a, an H pipe section here. It's designed to be a bolt in, so you, you do have to cut the resonator, um, but you cut the resonator, pull it out, then a piece like this bolts right in. And it does change the sound signature, changes the volume, changes some of the flow, and it surprisingly is a, a significant change to an exhaust system. Without going through thousands of dollars to change the whole exhaust system, you can change the critical part of the exhaust system to get a little bit more performance, sound, attitude, anger, if you will, and spend under $300. So uh, as part of the engineered solution is attack what the challenge is and provide a solution to the challenge versus just doing the whole ball of wax at once, which can be financially the same as throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So that's uh, that's pretty cool. So you, you talked a, um, a little bit about um, sound, um, and I've got a couple of a couple more questions. Explain sound engineering. That's something that it seems to me like you focus a lot um, on sound, um, and sound engineering is a term that I'm not that familiar with or hadn't heard um, from years back. So that's um, that's something that I'd, I'd kind of like to learn more about what your take is on that. Good. And I'll try to uh, I'll try to make this as 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 fun as we can without it being too techno geeky. But um, let's let's start with the very beginning part of the sound. Right? Is exhaust system does not make sound. Exhaust system doesn't create noise. An exhaust system will uh, channel, refine, uh, accentuate the sound that the engine makes. Right? So um, I, everybody knows this, but maybe haven't really thought about it this way. Um, it's the reason why a V8 does not sound like a V6, does not sound like a four-cylinder. They, they can't. The engine, being the instrument, is different in those, those occasions, right? So it, it's really no different than being in band class, when back in the day where they had band class. And you know you really like the sound of a tuba, but you're playing a trumpet. Well. Try to make your trumpet sound like a tuba. You can do that. It's called pick up the tuba, right? So you can't make a four-cylinder sound like a V8 based on just exhaust, right? You have to you have to have the originating sound be present. But from that point, once you have a sound uh, being produced, now the exhaust system, like I said, we can we can control or manage what you're experiencing in terms of um, actual sound and the perception of sound. So let me explain those two things. The actual sound is obviously what you are hearing both inside and outside of the car. Uh, six cylinder to me is a, is a sporty sports car type sound. And if we manage it correctly, the vehicle that it's in can have that sporty performance sound. Uh, V8 is tough, guttural, brute, muscular, right? It's, it's the badass. Let's call it what it is. And how do we deliver that toughness in the sound? That's part of our sound engineering. Um, four cylinders, um, four cylinders can sound uh, tough and cool. They'll never sound as full as a V8 because it's half of a V8. Um, the, the musical beat, I'm not a musician, but the musical beat of a six cylinder is got a half beat in it, which is a little off in our ear, right? So that's why, you know, why doesn't a V6 ever sound as cool as a V8? It's because of the orchestra under hood. Um, so once you've man managed the sound to match the orchestra under hood, then the perception of sound is left. And the perception of sound, uh, we put buzzwords on as body boom, drone, resonance, all three of those things would be referring to the same phenomenon. And it is a harmonic frequency. Again, the engine is the origin of the sounds and the vibrations and a lot of the 
NVH things that go on in your vehicle happen in the engine. It's true that your chassis and driveline can add other NVH things, but for now we're talking about uh, NVH that originates at the engine. So as you hit natural frequencies, um, a natural frequency is vibrating something at a frequency that is, that is natural to its physical makeup, is a short way of describing it. And once you hit that point, it will continue to vibrate and will amplify. And that amplification becomes a pulse wave, a pressure change. Your ear takes that pressure change and tells your brain that it's a sound. All right, so your ear works based on wavelengths, which is a pressure change. Um, but it's what we're talking about by boom is it's an inaudible pressure change. Um, proof of pudding is you can put a tape recorder, your phone, whatever, uh, record body boom or resonance in your car. You, you can't. It's not a sound. It's a pressure. Um, but it's not comfortable. It's not a pleasing experience. It's not something that most people want. I have had customers call me and say that they want as much drone as they can possibly get. Um, I believe they don't understand what they're asking for, but that's, you know, customers always right. Um, and another example of resonance or drone, just so you can identify with it, it, it's the same experience as if you're going down the highway and you roll down your back two windows and you get that whoa, 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 whoa type sound. Um, it, it's not. It's the pressure changing at a, at a rapid rate in your passenger compartment and your ear is pulsating and you're telling your brain that it's a sound. Truly, it's not. It's, it's resonance. Um, so there are ways to manage resonance in an exhaust system. Now that you know what it is, uh, we can measure and monitor how it occurs, when it occurs, and we happen to use a device called a Helmholtz device, um, which was essentially developed by a, a German engineer as a, a noise canceling device. Think of it kind of like creating white noise uh, mitigation inside of your exhaust system. So we pick the frequency that is setting off body boom or resonance, and we capture that wavelength. We revert it back through the exhaust system, and it cancels out uh, that particular mode. And that will allow you to have the, the pleasing driving experience while having the cool sound coming out of the back of the car. That's sound engineering. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and not too far, not too far. So, uh, you know, not too far over anybody's head. So um, I can tell you that um, the conversation so far has generated a lot of comments um, okay. and it has generated a few um, questions as well. And so um, I didn't want to um, bombard you with too many um, questions, but since we have the MRT shop cam, set up and you talked about manufacturing um, because you do that then obviously you have machines and, and equipment and i see you have a few cars um, up on the the lift um, for various different reasons probably sound engineering i'm assuming um, <laughs> so so why don't we go to the the turn the shop cam on and okay. um, maybe you can give us just like a, a little overview of what you've got going on in the back sure yeah so uh, Kind of, kind of proof of point, when we say that we make uh, our exhaust systems here at MRT, uh, we really literally do, right? We're not coming up with an idea and outsourcing the idea. We start with straight tube. Uh, we use US grade 304 stainless steel, steel manufactured in the United States. And we load the straight tools on these machines. These are our CNC tube benders. And uh, they allow us to bend the tube into a variety of shapes. If Dave, you can get the tubes on the floor behind the benders there. Um, so these machines will produce uh, these kind of tubes, right? So they're all bent into a specific, consistent way. The CNC element means that they're going to bend that tube that way every time. So, you know, this tube was bent wrong really doesn't happen when you, when you get into this level of machine. Um, once the tube is bent, then we will, we will segment it, literally mark it, and cut it into pieces. And that tube then produces a pile kind of like this. And this is a variety of individual pieces that then get assembled in a fixture. 
And this is one of the things that uh, is a product from uh, our, our efforts with Dr. Deming, is uh, designing quality in. Our, our assembly fixtures are also our check gauges. So once we set the tubes into the fixture, we've controlled every uh, significant characteristic of that exhaust system. And what that means is that if the tube isn't bent right, it will not fit into that fixture and therefore cannot be assembled into an exhaust system. Um, once we nest all of the pieces into that fixture, uh, we hand weld each system. Uh, we will TIG or MIG weld depending on the application. And from there, the assembler will inspect the system and then finally it will go, which is our, our third inspection if you're counting, and then it will go up into our shipping and receiving area where each system is cleaned, uh, final inspection, uh, wrapped, uh, protected. So if we have tips that are polished stainless, we wanna add extra protection on the tips so they don't get marred in shipping. Uh, or if we've applied our very high temperature ceramic coating on the tips to give the exhaust tip a, a color uh, effect, uh, we again will be protecting that tip with extra um, material so that it it doesn't get too damaged by our friends at FedEx and UPS who never damage anything, I'm sure. Yeah, that's um, that's that's an interesting um, little shop tour there. And it looks like um, you pretty much have everything you need to, to get the job done. And I, I like the niche manufacturing. I, I particularly um, like the the attention to um, detail in terms of processes and checkpoints. Um, you know that I've worked um, on the OEM side, um, well, top tier, the aftermarket into to OEM side, and so we we hear words like PPAP. Um, which is a which is a scary term if you're somebody like me because that means hundreds of hours of work, um, but essentially it's it's very thorough documentation of the entire manufacturing um, process and it can be quite detailed. I've done it on the electronic side of the business, um, and and I can tell you Ford's um, Ford's pretty pretty stringent. You know our our PPAPs, um, you know they really hold us to the fire on those. Um, we also have, you know, the design validation process reporting um, side of it, and we have the, the testing side of it. And for us, there's 21 different unique tests that we have to perform on an electronics product. Um, and, and so it's it looks like basically you've taken what you were doing at Ford Motor Company and you've implemented that on your your manufacturing side. And so I know the tremendous amount of time, effort and, and work that it takes um, to put all of that together and, and then maintain it, um, you know, as, as well. So um, really interesting stuff there. Um, so before we get to Carrie's got um, a pretty long list of, of questions to go through. <laughs> and we did have an advanced question from a viewer um, that I wanted to ask as well. But um, I understand that you're you're getting ready to sell it, celebrate your uh, 20th anniversary next year. Is that right? Has it been 20 years? Can you believe it? I had brown hair then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, 20 years. It's uh, it's been it's been quite a trip, quite a roller coaster. A lot has happened in the industry in 20 years. A lot has happened at MRT in 20 years. Uh, one of the cool parts about small business is. Um, being able to be flexible and to adapt quickly to to change. And the marketplace has changed, the customers have changed, the OEM products have changed. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, that's been a, a fun part of being in business in the last 20 years is to to participate and and to play in that in that change. You know, an engineer at the end of the day is a is a problem solver, a problem and solution identifier and then implement the solution. That's basically what an engineer is. And uh, this environment has created a lot of excitement for an engineer. Yeah, yeah no, it, it, it certainly has. And, and so one more thing um, that I wanted to mention, um, I wanted to wish you and Lisa a happy anniversary. 
because I oh. think that we're right around anniversary time. This is SEMA week, and, and I always remember uh, going to the SEMA show. I haven't been since 2019, um, mostly due to COVID, um, where I got COVID actually. Um, yeah, but I, I would always too. see I would always see you and Lisa at at the SEMA show, and that was always your anniversary week. And, yep. and um, I know that there was at least one or two years when she probably said, "Hey, let's not go to the SEMA show." And let's have a real anniversary <laughs> vacation trip. Yep. So uh, it doesn't look like you're on vacation right now. So hopefully you have something <laughs> planned. Yeah, we do in a couple of weeks. And thank you for that. She uh, She's tolerated me for more than 30 years. I can't believe that. <laughs> well, that's right. great. Lisa's a wonderful person. Um, one thing I wanted to add is if you're interested in any of the MRT products, uh, they are listed on our website under exhaust. Uh, I believe it's the only product, uh, exhaust product we're listing. Kenny believes in only listing what he believes in. So uh, we have limited products because of that. He sells what he uses and what he believes in. So that is on our website. Uh, the MRT book, there's a link in there if you would like to purchase it. And guess what, uh, Scott? Two people have already purchased your book. Joe Johnson, Love it. Well, thank you, no. And yes, I do. Also, hey, Joe. Tim, Tim Allen has purchased it. So. Yeah. And we're getting a bunch of people that are interested in it. So if you've just joined us, we have Scott Hogue from MRT on, and he has graciously uh, given us a book uh, to give away today. So how you can win that is sign up for our newsletter or and put it in the comments that you signed up. Or if you're already signed up, just put that you're already signed up. Uh, the reason we're pushing the newsletter is we're having a whole bunch of new products come out, mainly apparel and Kenny Brown, you know, just tribute type things. So make sure you sign up so you see everything that we have. Uh, during the next few weeks, once we get it going, which will probably be around Black Friday, uh, we'll have some products available. And then through the holidays, every Saturday, we'll be showing some products and also giving some away. So make sure you join us live. And we'd love for you to join us. Again, just add, uh, sign up for the newsletter to win Scott's book, but make sure you put it in the comments that you signed up. Okay, Scott, we have a ton of different comments and questions. And Brad, I'm going to ask you to help me as well, because I think I'll run out of breath here. So, <laughs> so let me get back to the comments. So uh, let me start with one of the comments that we have uh, questions is what are the quality um, right there? What are the qualification certification does MRT have? Quality certifications. Um... I'm not exactly sure what the what the question is um, referring to, uh, but the the quality certification is literally our our process, right? So we are we are the first customer of our quality. Um, I don't supply product to companies like Ford, GM, or Chrysler directly, um, honestly, nor do I have interest in it. Uh, and the reason for that is, is that they start driving our bus and they start changing the complexion of, of who and what we are. And that's important to me. And that's, that's why the business is, is set up this way. So um, having QOS certifications, those sorts of certifications, those are driven by the OEMs to become an OEM supplier. Um, it's not appropriate for our space. Um, and, and I mean it in that it's not appropriate. Uh, I understand what those processes are. I've been a part of them at the OEM level. And uh, our process isn't terribly complex to, to document. Um, and it is completely regarded in terms of success and failure by the people who are involved in it, which we monitor. So QS process, in summary, is a great process to say, um, what you are doing and how you are doing it. It doesn't say or monitor that you're doing it right or doing it well. If doing it badly is your process, QoS will just say you're doing it badly all the time. So uh, it, it is different and it is appropriate for our space. I hope that answers your question, but yeah, it's- I think that's good. I, I didn't mean to throw that one out you. That's a tough no. one to answer because I, I get that. So um, here's another one. Do tips affect the exhaust sound? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the tip 
or tips can uh, actually be a megaphone or a restrictor. Uh, you can condition your exhaust uh, note by the tip. Um, location, orientation, size. So uh, absolutely, it is, it is part of the song for sure. Okay, again, Tim Allen just bought your collector's edition book. Uh, there's a link in the comments if you're interested in purchasing that at, or go to shop MRT. Uh, we also have, uh, people are really impressed with, uh, Jorge says he's just really impressed with uh, Dr. Deming. And uh, yeah. Jorge is in the, uh, the automotive market, uh, after, not aftermarket, the automotive uh, market as well. He works for somebody and I can't re remember who. Um, let's see, Eric Lehigh. Um, okay, never mind. You don't need to know that one. I'm getting, there's so many I'm trying to get through them That's here. okay. That's good. <laughs> It's yeah. good activity, good action. Yeah. Yep. Keep them coming. <laughs> okay, here's a comment. Uh, a, that's amazing quality inspection. So, I oh, mean, thank you. what you do compared to other people in the aftermarket is incredible. So, uh, here's another one on Dr. Deming. Wow, that is an honor in my career as an industrial and systems engineer. So, that's what Corey is. So, he understands that. Awesome. It was. Oh. Yeah. Special time. And then uh, we have uh, Fishing uh, JTS. He has a question, is aluminized steel equal, does it equal mild steel or is it, um, I still uh, systems labeled aluminized. He still sees systems yep. labeled aluminized. Great, great question. Yeah, it, 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 aluminized steel will still be the mild steel and the aluminized refers to the coating that has been applied to the steel. And that's add a, added as a rust, um, suppressant it doesn't eliminate rust it'll slow the rusting process down now here's a question from tim allen um or a comment he's i like that you still offer a high flow catted h pipe for a fox body mustang there aren't as many there's not they're not common these days it's one part because of its cost and function that one that's of high quality because it's needed to work and work well so yeah. Thank you, Tim. And that, let's just talk about that a little bit. H pipes and catalysts have been a point of controversy, contention, and confusion in the recent years. And let's just talk a little bit about it. The the EPA has has cracked down um, pretty seriously on people taking their uh, emissions components off of their street driven cars. Uh, to avoid emissions uh, compliance. And one of the things that we have done histor historically on exhaust is, is we've immediately gone to headers. We can talk about that again as a second note. Um, take off the, the, uh, the catalysts, go to larger diameter tube, and make your exhaust system absolutely free flowing. That equals maximum performance, maximum power, um, etc. Now in a 1970 uh, big block Mustang, check all of those boxes. You do all of those things to your car and it's going to be a beast. Um, in today's technology, let's fast forward to the, to the 2020s and the manifold designs from the factories are getting better and better and better. So they're going from a, a log style uh, manifold. Dave's going to show you what I mean by that. Um, the picture that, that he's showing up right now, uh, the manifold portion is a big cast iron hunk and it's all four cylinders feeding into one trunk or one log. Uh, the fluid dynamics of this manifold are horrific. There, there basically are no fluid dynamics there. So changing that to you know, our aftermarket version shown here which is a individual tube uh, header. Uh, this says going on an AC Cobra, uh, this is the application, but the fluid dynamics, the path of the flow is incredibly different and the performance gains are gonna be immediately noticeable, right? So um, getting to back to the, to the catalysts, the, uh, the catalysts are there for several reasons. One, obviously, to, to, to clean the emissions, um, but a lot of the engines, especially modern day engines, are tuned for a certain amount of back pressure 
and the the tuning isn't just for flow but it's it's heat management it's managing um, scavenging i mean there's a lot of elements that the whole system is is engineered to work together so just just lopping off catalysts off of your exhaust system uh, doesn't instantly give you the results that you are you are hoping for to the degree that you are hoping to get them uh, first of all you need to tune the car to run and operate correctly without uh, the catalyst in place and they can be tuned and they can operate correctly and they can operate almost as clean as if you had catalysts so um, if you have a purpose-built car um, let's just say we're talking about a race car I know that's kind of common in this this clientele here um, you want the you want the exhaust to get away from the engine in a clean efficient manner uh, you want the engine to be operating optimally meaning you are burning all of the fuel that you can burn without burning up the motor right too lean is fast until you blow up mm -hmm. yep. those physics aren't going to change right so the the tuning and the balance of the tune uh it it goes hand in hand exhaust is part of that whole tuning exercise um, so we do in, encourage people to retain catalysts, uh, especially if the car is going to be driven on the street at all. Uh, stay legal. You're not giving up uh, much of the performance side. Um, in, in some of the aftermarket exhaust systems, Dave's going to show you a couple points on, an, on a stock system. Um, there are several points of restriction in the exhaust system. Um, and that's where the tube necks down naturally to accommodate certain features uh, in the exhaust. Each one of these neck down points um, are a restriction and they reduce exhaust flow. And sometimes they reduce exhaust flow extremely. So all of these things that you're seeing on this picture, this comes from the factory this way, right? I didn't, I didn't damage this exhaust system, <laughs> even though it looks damaged. So getting a straight, clean flow uh, is, is important. Um, Again, back to the catalyst, I'm sorry, I'm kind of derailing all over the place, but um, the catalyst right now, here, here's the, the literal law of the land, is that if a licensed repair facility removes a functioning emissions device off of an emissions equipped vehicle, they're breaking the law and they're subject to some pretty serious fines. And uh, for years, they've kind of given a blind eye, uh, at least in the Midwest, they're they're taking this as no joke and and they're levying some serious fines um, a secondary question so I'll cut to the to the chase would be so why does MRT still make H pipes uh, there still is a legal appropriate loophole in the system and it's not really a loophole it's just keeping in mind the performance car community is if your vehicle is set up for racing for off-road application and performance, uh, it's not against the law to you for you to put a non-catted or a high-performance cat system on your car. Um, it's when those cars live on the street that um, our emissions laws are still in effect. So, important little nuance I'm giving people is for off-road race applications, it's legal and appropriate to do those kind of changes. I have a little story to share with you about that. This is years and years and years ago when the EPA started getting, you know, really tight on this stuff. And we were very well known. We were in almost every publication, always art articles about our high performance cars. I can remember the scene directly. So uh, we were in our building and Ken looked out the window and said, what are those five or six guys walking in this industrial part? They have long coats like, you know, the, like uh, cowboy, you know, you know, when, when, when they pull out their guns. They had, I can't remember, six or eight people come into our facility and raid us to try wow. to find, yeah. And they found like six or seven cats and we had to prove to them that they belonged to a car and we were smart enough. So on our invoices, we had that was a, a porn, you know, non-street and then it was a race car. And so we never were fined on anything, but they were using us as an example. And I can't remember a couple other com companies 
because of our high profile. So yep. they're serious about it. And they'll come. Yep. I, I'm, they may have had guns under those coats. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, it, it it's no joke. Uh, there still is a way to do it appropriately. And, you know, that's kind of the guidance is, is make sure you know what the what the rules are and have a defendable path. So uh, we're going to ask a couple more questions. This is your last call. If you would like to win the uh, uh, Scott's book, uh, he will be giving one away at uh, in about another five minutes because I know a lot of you have to leave um, at a certain time. So in another five minutes, we'll be doing that. If you want to win, put your name in the comments and sign up for our newsletter or tell us that you've already signed up for it. Okay, here's some more questions. Are you ready? This is a good one. Oh, that's not the good one, but that's interesting, Roy. <laughs> so it's Bob Jones. There we go. <laughs> How much of a trade-off is there between sound engineering and performance aspects? Uh, well, I have to use a party line on this one. If they're done right, there is there is no trade-off. Um, the how we do it is we we develop the system for the performance path and package and performance sound, and then we drive the vehicle, do the evaluation. And if there are uh, some of the drone or the resonant issues that we need to mitigate, uh, we will add those components to the system. So the trade-off there is going to be essentially weight, right? So we're gonna add tube to the exhaust system to make an acoustic chamber to manage that sound. So for a race application where weight is very important, it may not be a good step to go to the what we call our drone management system and and mitigate that drone. You know, if it's a race car, yeah, deal with the race car elements, right? There's a lot of things that are happening on a race car that you accept and uh, don't worry about that you wouldn't accept on your street driven car. Um, but as far as fluid dynamics and back pressure and performance, our acoustic chambers don't change any exact exhaust flow or the path of the exhaust, so it does not take any of the performance away. That's great, good explanation. So I have a, I'm gonna go down to the very bottom of the comments because there's some related to what you were just talking about. And uh, one of it is, uh, wow, that crimping is crazy. And yeah. <laughs> thanks for the great explanation on uh, catalysts and emissions. That was wonderful. And uh, Jorge says, I can tune my Fox to run clean at 14.7 to 15.3 without cats. So, nice. Yep. It can be done. Absolutely. Uh, the time it takes to, to develop a calibration on a car to run that clean obviously takes more than a few minutes, and that's not something that the OEM can do. So though the OEM calibrations are very good, very clean, they're also very safe, which leaves performance on the table, leaves unburned fuel on the table, which pretty much is then the reason the catalysts are required to take care of the unburned, unused fuel that did not get consumed in the combustion process. Well, that's cool. So uh, Brad, do you want to ask the next question? Uh, sure, I can. Um, I was kind of going down the list, so I want to make sure that we don't miss anything. So this is Dylan's question. Scott, you can probably see this. Um, is there a calculation yep. you use to determine the proper header and exhaust system size? Uh, that way you maximize exhaust velocity without compromising performance with excess back pressure. So uh, interesting question there. Yeah, there there absolutely are calculations that uh, that can be performed. Um, and they are going to be pretty much vehicle specific. Uh, you getting to the racing side of the business. This is one of the variables that you can measure, monitor, and control. Um, so displacement of the engine, operating RPM, whether the engine is uh, normally aspirated or uh, supercharged or turbocharged, right? All of these things are going to become uh, variables. Um, and last but not insignificant is package, right? So unfortunately, some of the times uh, we don't reach our optimum configuration uh, because we physically just can't put that tube in that position given the environment of the car. So uh, on a laboratory bench or a, an engine dyno, you could design an optimum exhaust system because you've got the world 
to package or package it in. But once you once you make it real and put it in a car, um, unfortunately, trade offs start to occur. Okay, so here's another good uh, question from Charles, um, and we know the answer. Does MRT only work with Ford brands? Uh, no, we uh, we began our life 20 years ago with the Ford brands. In fact, if somebody turns their calendar back, they'll uh, remember that in that period of time, Mustang was the only performance pony car, right? So it made sense for us to be Mustang racing technologies. Um, about a minute after that uh, became reality that we needed to do more than just Mustangs. And uh, uh, we, we have shortened their name to MRT and we went, went gangbusters on all of the makes and models. So since then, MRT designs and manufactures the world's finest handcrafted exhaust for uh, vehicles in the Ford, GM, Chrysler, Toyota, Subaru, uh, Polaris, uh, missing several uh, lines. So we, we have over 300 systems that we've designed and we manufacture uh, for all of, all of these vehicles. Um, you know, GM with the Camaro and the Corvette uh, have strong enthusiast vehicles and our product works very well in those applications and we have a strong presence. Um, if everybody in the performance world knows that, uh, that Dodge with their, their Hemis and all of their uh, crazy factory horsepower machines, um, you know, these things are knuckle dragger muscle cars and uh, we can make them sound cool. So yeah, we play in a lot of different spaces. Uh, we like to go where the enthusiast is playing and uh, we want to meet them there with the best product so they can enjoy their experience even more. Okay, great. So we, we're, we're getting close to the end of the questions. Um, although we still have a lot of, of comments. So um, we'll throw in Alex's uh, question here. It's a simple one. Uh, does MRT exhaust require new program? I'm programming, essentially. If so, does MRT provide it? So I, I don't think you do that, but. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, and again, it depends on the exhaust system that you are talking about. Um, if you are looking at one of our non-catted H pipes for a race application, um, it requires a tune because you no longer have catalysts and you no longer have uh, monitoring of an emissions device. Um, our tuning solution is through uh, SET uh, and uh, MRT does some custom tunes, but uh, uh, the SET product is the, uh, the device that we use to uh, interface with the stock um, ECU and, and help adapt the calibrations for those particular applications. Uh, anything that we make that is after the catalyst, so the cat back systems and axle back systems, none of them require a tune. That is part of our criteria. Uh, even with the new vehicles that have the uh, uh, active fuel management and the, uh, the variable sound control, so the, you know, like the GT500s, GT350s, you have the different modes you can put your exhaust in. Uh, when you convert to an MRT exhaust system, uh, you're getting full-time performance, full-time cool sound, right? So your driving modes still work, but your exhaust modes, uh, you're stuck with just cool all the time. I mean, sorry, guys. Um, but we have the either mechanical devices or electronic devices that interface with the, um, the displacement displacement on demand devices or the variable mode exhaust devices that allow your computer to be satisfied that those devices are in fact working. They're not affecting emissions, but they are important that they're not setting off the, uh, the check engine light from, from your computer saying, I have part of my exhaust system no longer functioning. So your, your computer is continuing to monitor how your engine really is is running and operating, and if there's an issue, it will warn you appropriately. Okay, so um, we we have just one more question, um, and that's it. We're gonna make everybody wait. <laughs> yeah. So one, one more question: um, Does MRT make any other products than just exhaust? Uh, that's from that that guy asked. Uh, <laughs> that guy. Than just just exhaust. So. Yeah, way to go, that guy. Yes, we we do. We historically we've made a lot of things, but uh, 
Uh, one of the, the fun things that, that we make, and uh, Dave is, is showing you a little zoom in on it, uh, we make uh, a, a device we call hood struts or hood props, and we make them for a variety of vehicles. Um, pretty much all of the Mustangs, um, Bronco, Maverick, Focus, Fusion, um, you know, and Mustang all the way back to the Fox body Mustang. And the premise behind this device, and this is our original design, uh, I have to put in a little, a little dig that it is also the most copied product in the world. Everybody seems to copy our ideas on this. Um, but what our approach is that we use factory, existing factory attachment points, and we adapt these gas cylinder struts that will hold your hood up and avoid you uh, eliminating the, the niece of the use of the, uh, the prop rod, which to me isn't aesthetically pleasing. And if you're working on your car, the prop rod is always in the freaking way. So uh, hood struts are a fun, a fun thing that we make and uh, it, it, it works well and gives you good access. Uh, we do, since metalworking is our specialty, we do make other, other bracketry uh, items and weldments. Uh, you know, on the Fox body, we make, we're the, uh, the pioneers of, of some fascia mounting brackets. Uh, they seem to always rot away on your Fox body when you go to restore them. Um, that bracket is either compromised, rusted away, flimsy, what have you. Uh, so we designed a more robust solution and uh, uh, kind of our product development goes down the path of finding a need and then finding a solution for that need and, and producing it. Well, Scott, thank you so much. Uh, why don't we give uh, Scott some thumbs up or in the comments just uh, say thank you, Scott, for sharing all his knowledge with us. Uh, obviously, you see Scott's very approachable. Um, he has a very good staff, so if you have questions on exhaust, you can call him or you can call yeah. us as well. Absolutely. So uh, we, we sell their products, and so anyway, just uh, give, give any of us a call and we'll be there. We're going to announce the winner right now. So, Scott, the winner, you choose between one and eight, a number. Five. Five. The winner is... Mike Bowman. Way to go, Mike. <laughs> Good going, Enjoy. Mike. Mike, uh, why don't you uh, send, uh, I think you've been talking to Rich. Why don't you give Rich a call on Monday, and we'll get your address and everything. We'll get that sent off to you. Uh, Mike won the book. Uh, the, it's a long title. It, engineering plus enthusiast equals excitement. Cool name. And um, also, I also want to note that um, Mike, the winner, is an existing M MRT customer. He uses uh, your uh, hood struts on his Fox. Awesome. Body. And actually, excellent. He, Thank he you, Mike. A, yeah, he had a question, and because uh, we, we posed a question online on our Facebook page, he had a question about how um, how does the exhaust fit with twin turbos? So, well, he, he wanted to know what was the best type of exhaust okay. setup for a turbocharged Mustang. Um, well, obviously with the turbo, uh, you're, you're playing with the exhaust uh, packaging and routing greatly to, you know, get the turbos to fit into your application. As far as material selection, uh, we use 304 stainless steel in all of our turbo applications. Uh, we've developed many turbo kits uh, actually for turbinetics uh, in our past. And, um, and that's the product that we use. Um, traditional clamps and V-band clamps are very popular in uh, turbo applications. Uh, I like the V-band clamps uh, better uh, just because of, of a more secure, uh, precise uh, clamping at that, at that particular joint. Um, you know, turbos kind of end up with, you know, you get 11 pounds crammed into a 10-pound bag. So keeping everything right where you want it is pretty important for success. Great. Okay. That was a, that was a great answer. It was a great answer. Um, just uh, uh, issue, what we're doing, oh, Brad, I cannot talk today. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so coming up in the next few weeks, we are going to have Donnie uh, on the, from d, d Performance talking transmissions. We also have Tim from G-Lock Brakes, who is going to be talking about brake pads and how, how to uh, select them based on how you're driving. And we are going to be having uh, just sharing all the new uh, Kenny Brown products that are coming out 
as far in our apparel line. Uh, Scott, hold up your mug there. So you were you were there. See, he has got the MRT <laughs> mug for, for his coffee. Uh, you'll be seeing some of that with Kenny Brown, and we're uh, we're also coming. Kenny had uh, done some testing on coffee, um, and so we'll be bringing out his coffee line as well. So, High octane, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> One is called Brad. What are they called? One is called O Dark Thirty because when he was racing and doing 24 hour races. Uh, he would the uh, coffee, stout coffee in the middle of the night is what you needed. So uh, <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, love so it. that is an extremely stout coffee. So yeah, he had he had some creative names. He had Daytona Dawn, which was his his early morning um, <laughs> Daytona <laughs> coffee. He had O Dark Thirty, um, and the, and there were a couple of others. So we're yeah, we're there's in the un, unleaded that. and honey brew. I think it was was it honey honey, honey brew. brew. Yeah, yeah, so that was my coffee because I didn't like his strong coffee. So he, he chose a coffee. I got to select, help him select that. So uh, pretty good. That's fun. Yeah, I that is it. really fun. Well, anyway, let's uh, sign off here. If anybody has any more comments, Brad, have you looked? Uh, oh, nope. You? Well, we've had we've had a few more comments. We had a lot of thank yous. Yes. Um, and oh, we had a lot you. of people who chimed in who who uh, are saying how much they love their MRT H pipes on their 2019 GT uh, Mustang, how much they love their hood struts, how much they love their Fox body exhaust. So we've, we've got a lot of uh, great awesome. uh, positive comments from uh, what I can only assume are loyal uh, customers of yours. And Thank it you. looks like Dylan just ordered a book as well. So. Um, Thanks, nothing Ellen. else, Scott. We 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 sold a few books um, today, nice. so that's good. I, <laughs> yeah. that's you awesome. know, Thank that, you. the whole book thing. I remember when you were on the book tour and we saw each other at Carlisle uh, yep. a couple of years, and, and so I know that has to be grueling to to travel around to car shows and um, yeah. pick your book out. But so I'm, I'm pretty sure you didn't think I knew how to read at that time. <laughs> I I was I didn't know that you could write a book. Um, so, uh, <laughs> So we also have one more quick comment. Jorge says, how can we contact Scott? Um, Jorge, I just call, look, go online and look at MRT and find their phone number and give them a call. I'm sure that's probably the best way. Or I'll send an email to their contact email. And do you know what that is, Scott? Is it info or is it contact us? Or what, what's um, your... Yeah, sales at mrt-direct.com. Okay. And that'll get so, right to us. Okay, perfect. So you can send it that way. So again, thank you, Scott, for doing this. And also in the background, we have a few people. And I know Dave is out there. He's been our photographer, videographer, and he's been doing a great job. In fact, Good. he's showing a picture of the book right now. So I'll put that up right there. So if you want that, and that is it. Awesome. So, yeah. So anyway, we'll see you next week. I think we are live again next week. And we will see you then at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time for the Cars and Coffee with Kenny Brown show. Take care, everyone. Have a good week. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.